Welcome to the Belly Button Window channel and episode 13 of the Jimi Hendrix story, like you've never heard it before. In this episode, we examine August 1967, including the various gigs, recording sessions, concerts, and the critical events for that month. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to related videos, performances, and stunning photographs from the period. By August of 1967, the Jimi Hendrix experience had spent ten months living in each other's pockets and out of suitcases. Noel described it as follows. The fatigue, the ceaseless round of drugs, the fans who followed us everywhere, and the creeps who stole from our hotel rooms, made us feel on the edge of screaming. Clearly the consequences of the gruelling touring schedule were starting to emerge, and we see the beginning of the dichotomy of the early Hendrix success story. Jimmy lost a lot of drive once we broke in the States. He seemed content enough to have conquered the place where he had struggled so hard. So thought Noel. We also see the beginning of the wedge, particularly with Noel, between the idea of Jimi Hendrix, the star, with Mitch and Noel being but support players, as opposed to the Jimi Hendrix experience, an equally fully-fledged three-piece band, which he articulated this way. We left England as the experience, but American success had promoted Jimmy and left Mitch and me in the deep background. And so, August sees another exhausting round of press functions, photo calls and gigs. August 1st, 6, a concert announced at the cellar in Cleveland, but cancelled. August 3rd, 4th, 5th, 7th and 8th saw the group performing at the Salvation, New York City. Also Tuesday, August 8th, prior to the last of the Salvation Club gigs, saw Jimmy back at Studio 76 Inc. New York for the second sessions of jamming and recording with Curtis Knight. Just to recap, on July 17, 1967, after making the decision to quit the Monkees on their US tour, Jimi Hendrix got together with his old bandmate and friend Curtis Knight, ostensibly to jam off the record at Ed Chalpin's PPX Studios, this decision would prove to be both fateful and controversial, since he was in the middle of a lawsuit filed against him by Chalpin at the time. The basis of the lawsuit stemmed from a three-year contract Hendrix signed prior to his success with the experience, covering October 1965 to October 1968. Signed while still just a session player, it offered only a 1% royalty. When Chaz Chandler, bassist of the Animals, decided to manage Jimmy, one of his first orders of business, was to buy out all of his existing contracts. Unfortunately, Jimmy neglected to tell him about the contract signed with PPX. In 1967, when Chalpin discovered Hendrix was suddenly a major recording star following the success of his first single, Hey Joe, multiple lawsuits were filed in an attempt to cash in on this newfound success. In Chalpin's mind, which he would contend for decades, he had given Hendrix an opportunity to develop his sound. Responding to the lawsuit, Hendrix's management contended that PPX were trying to market older recordings as new releases, but in jamming with Knight at PPX Studios with microphones recording, PPX subsequently could make the claim that they in fact were in possession of new recordings with the artist's full knowledge and approval. Even further, Hendrix would go back this second time, much to the dismay of his lawyers and management. Although hundreds of bootlegs have appeared from the limited amount of legitimate recordings made between Hendrix, Curtis Knight and the Squires, many contain looped samples and vocals overdubbed at a much later date. Before starting the recordings, we can clearly hear Jimmy telling Ed Chalpin, PPX producer, who was in the control booth, that he does not want his name to appear on these titles. Before a take for Gloomy Monday, which will subsequently become You Can't Use My Name, bootleg. Jimmy, I ask you not to use my name on this. Ed, I'm not going to use it, don't worry. Jimmy found this sound a little light and outdated. Hendrix, Edward, can you hear me? In other words, like you can't, you can't use my name for all that, okay? No, seriously though, seriously. Chalpin, don't worry, I won't use it, don't worry. Shortly thereafter, Chalpin licensed the recordings to Capitol Records, which released an album titled Get That Feeling With Billing, as Jimi Hendrix and Curtis Knight in 1967. After Hendrix, Reprise Records, its official American label, objected to the misleading billing and cover photo of Hendrix performing at the Monterey Pop Festival, Capitol released a second album, Flashing in 1968, billed as 
Jimmy, Hendrix plays Curtis Knight Sings with a sketch of Knight and Hendrix. Chalpin subsequently licensed the recordings to dozens of minor record labels who used them to release more than a hundred so-called Jimi Hendrix albums. To give the appearance of new material, songs were often doctored by editing and layering and giving it new names. Hendrix commented, They, the Knight Chalpin sessions, were nothing but jam sessions, man, with a band called The Squires. No, I didn't sing on Hush Now, which was later dubbed by Knight trying to copy my voice. In the last few years, the Hendrix estate has acquired the rights to the PPX recordings, and in 2015 they released You Can't Use My Name, an official release that mostly covers the pre-experience recordings, as well as some of the August 67 material. The Jimi Hendrix experience then traveled to Washington, D.C., where they performed four nights at the Ambassador Theater, two shows per night. Wednesday, August 9th, Ambassador Theater. Also on the program was a local band called Natty Bumpo, Roy Buchanan and Jimmy participate in a jam session after one of the evenings at the Ambassador Theatre. Thursday, August 10th, Ambassador Theatre, two shows. This gig was memorable in that Mitch Mitchell got sick in the afternoon and missed this show. He suffered from suspected appendicitis, and an unknown drummer named Bill Havu from the support group Natty Bumpo replaced him. It's also worth noting that it was the only time he ever missed a gig with Hendrix that he was booked to play. Noel stated that, when Mitch missed the gig due to a bad gut, the English papers ran the story. Mitch Mitchell collapsed on stage and was rushed to hospital. Miller became a pet name for Mitch, and he further adds that, Our gigs were very serious attempts to create a fun atmosphere. If we started in a good positive days, we could feed off each other's highs and get higher still. Friday, August 11th, Ambassador Theatre, two shows. When Jimi Hendrix came to Washington and blew its mind, Here's some recollections from fans who attended the one of the eight Ambassador performances. Johnny Castle was 17 and an aspiring hippie at the time who played bass. He and his buddies headed out to the Ambassador on the Wednesday night. They went to see the Natty Bumpo, an admired local band. Bumpo, who was opening all week for some other band that was playing. We had no idea of the headlining act, Castle recalled. The Natty Bumpo came out and played and that was a cool groove, Castle says. There was a brief delay and then here comes the Jimi Hendrix experience. We didn't know who was who. They had psychedelic clothes. Their hair was all curly and poofed out. They immediately started playing. I was like, my eyes bulged out. I had never seen or heard anything like that in my life. Hendrix was playing behind his head, between his legs, with his teeth. He was just effortlessly slinging the guitar about. I remember when he did The Wind Cries Mary, he did the solo with his teeth. He was playing the living crap out of the guitar. He totally eviscerated my psyche. I was never so blown away in my life, nor have I been since. The morning after seeing Hendrix at the Ambassador, Castle awoke with a new conviction that the sky was the limit for him and his generation, and anything was possible. That feeling was already in the air, he says, and Jimi Hendrix just confirmed it. Originally an old theatre, the three operators, all in their early twenties, dubbed the Psychedelic Power and Light Company, fashioned the ambassador into Washington's answer to the Fillmore West and the Avalon Ballroom in San Francisco. They had in mind a total involvement space, with surreal light shows projected from the balcony onto vast screens. The most radical thing about the ambassador was the simple fact that the three partners were of the same generation and wavelength as the artists and the audience. Grown-up culture and capital were cut out almost completely. The ambassador, which had only opened in late July with the Los Angeles band The Peanut Butter Conspiracy, stood as a pure expression of that sweet, naive side of the 1960s that was about to go up in flames and down in self-destruction. For many, Hendrix's five-night stand was the essence of the essence, before he, and they, lost it too. The theatre operators were still trying to ingratiate themselves to the community, and so was conceived one of the most improbable gigs ever staged in Washington, the free matinee that the Jimi Hendrix experience and several jazz acts performed for hundreds of neighborhood children at the Ambassador. Mitch Mitchell was sick, apparently, so Hendrix asked Natty Bumpo drummer Bill Havu to sit in. Hendrix told the audience, We have the drummer from the Natty Bumpo, it will be okay, and then hit the first chord, recalls Havu, who now owns an art gallery in Denver. I went, Oh my God, Foxy Lady. I just laid down a good strong rhythm and that worked. Steve Barker, who was 18 and helped out in the theatre, saw all of Hendrix's shows, but remembers this one in particular. Hendrix played some blues. 
I have always felt privileged to have been there that time, he says. There were little children, but also elderly people. Everybody seemed into it. He wasn't doing the rock star Hendrix theatrics. It was really special. Jazz hippies happened together, the Washington Post reported the next day. The story estimated that 500 children as young as five heard the music and danced and skipped under the lights. Spencer Davis, who was 16, and no relation to the band The Spencer Davis Group, told the paper, I think it's dynamite. They ought to give the hippies more of a chance to do this sort of thing. They're all right. Between sets of the night shows, Hendrix and his band mingled with the audience like slightly cooler older brothers or went across the street with new Washington friends for a beer at the showboat lounge. Redding and Mitchell were gregarious and outgoing, while Hendrix, in contrast to his stage persona, was quiet and diffident. One time Hendrix took a seat in the Ambassador's snack area near Debbie Clark and Jean Keskinen, two 15-year-olds from Prince George's County. He seemed like a nice guy, Keskinen says. All his feathers and looks were a lot to take in at that time. But Charles Smith, co-founder of the Natty Bumpo, was unsettled by his brush with the talent about to go supernova. I remember walking into the lobby and there he was standing like he was in outer space, Smith says. He was just staring. He never saw me. I knew he was really stoned. I thought, boy, that doesn't look good. The band stayed at the Shoreham Hotel, now the Omni Shoreham on Calvert Street. Redding and Mitchell sometimes hung out at the pool, while Hendrix stayed in his room. He wrote a draft of Bold as Love on Shoreham Stationery, with crossouts and additions. The song would appear soon on the band's second album, Axis, Bold as Love. My yellow in this case is not so mellow. In fact, I'm trying to say it's frightened, like me Friday, and tickets rose to $2.50 for the weekend. The relative few who attended were seeing history in the making, says Washington music historian Mark Opsasnik, author of Capital Rock, who is documenting a century of local pop music performances. He ranks the Ambassador gigs among the three most influential DC debuts ever, with Bill Haley and his Comets at the Blue Mirror on 14th Street NRBW in June 1953, and the Beatles at the Washington Coliseum in February 1964. It changed the course of music in the city. The set list from night to night was a roster of soon-to-be greatest hits and FM radio staples. Purple Haze, Foxy Lady, Hey Joe, The Wind Cries Mary, Red House, Like a Rolling Stone by Bob Dylan and Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band by The Beatles. This is truly the ground floor of his taking root in the United States. A fabulous time to see the band, says Hendrix biographer John McDermott. The average young person might have heard of Jimi Hendrix if they read an underground newspaper, but there was literally nothing going on in terms of buzz. This guy laid it all on the line, desperately determined to make it in the U.S. Saturday The party in a Georgetown row house happened after the Saturday show, as near as some folks can remember. It was just so low-key, Mike Paper, who helped out at the theatre, says of the party. People were smoking dope, drinking beer and wine. I remember distinctly Jimmy sitting on the couch strumming an acoustic guitar. It was just different times back in those days. Nobody said, oh my God, we're hanging out with Jimi Hendrix. We knew it was special, but at the same time, we were 18-year-old kids. Another night, folks converged on Bumpo Drummer Havu's place in the 1800 block of Corcoran Street, NW. We had promised dinner. We were also broke, Havu says so they liberated a big pot of spicy rice that their Korean neighbors had stowed in the common refrigerator. Hendrix sat on the floor in a corner and ate this really hot, bad rice we cooked up. He was just sort of watching the scene. He had recently come over from England, and I think he was trying to absorb what was going on with the hippie movement, quote-unquote. Phil Wood was 16 years old when he collected a string from the guitar that Jimi Hendrix burned on August 13, 1967, the last of a five-night gig at the Ambassador, Tony L. Sandys, The Washington Post. Hendrix explored Georgetown, and while there drew police attention, Michael Cassidy, younger brother of Jack Cassidy of the Jefferson Airplane, ran into Hendrix on the street. They were crossing against a red light when, next thing I know, cops pull up to us, Cassidy says. The pair was taken to a precinct station for jaywalking. Cassidy, who was still in high school, had to call his mother to come get him. Hendrix called a band associate. If you had the long hair, the cops didn't like you. But Hendrix was beyond that, Cassidy says. His hair wasn't even that long, but his clothing was so far out. He was dressed to the hilt, 
with the scarves and the whole bit, you know, and they kind of didn't know what to think of that. Sunday. As word spread of Hendrix's stage magic, attendance grew night by night, until about 800 showed up for the Sunday finale, says Mike Schreibman, who handled publicity for the ambassador. Even so, the theatre was still half empty. The Who was opening for Herman's Hermits at Dar Constitution Hall that night. Some fans planned to catch The Who, skip The Hermits and make it to the ambassador for Hendrix's second set. Before the gig, Shep Tullier, then 19, met the band at the Shoreham. Tullier, who now plays in blue suede bop and solo projects, brought a stack of British music journals he subscribed to, which the musicians were eager to peruse after two months in the United States. Walking into their rooms, Tullier heard a voice on Hendrix's portable record player. He assumed it was some avant-garde spoken word piece until Hendrix told him it was Winnie the Pooh. The band caught a cab to the theatre. In the dressing room, Hendrix called Schreibman over. He whispered, Can you get me some lighter fluid? recalls Schreibman, who became a founding member of the Washington Area Music Association. I said in a real loud voice, Oh, are you going to set your guitar on fire? He was really upset that I'd broken the secret. Hendrix had pulled the pyro stunt only twice before in London in March, then at Monterey in June, according to Hendrix chronologists. Before the Monterey film popularized the evidence, it would still be a surprise to most fans. Schreibman crossed the street and bought the fluid at People's Drug. After seeing the Who's Pete Townsend smash but not burn, his guitar at Constitution Hall, 16-year-old guitar player Phil Wood, and a buddy hurried to the ambassador. Wood had seen Hendrix's Thursday show, so he knew to sit on the floor just in front of stage right, where Hendrix would stand. He felt someone take a seat to his left, so close in the crowd that their legs touched. It was Townsend. Standing against the wall was the Who's bass player, John Entwistle. Hendrix walks out with his Stratocaster, Wood recalls. He looks at Townsend. He plugs in his Strat, and without even tuning up, he starts playing I Can't Explain. The Who hit. Noel Redding hasn't seen them, doesn't get it. Like, what key is this? Pete laughs, Entwistle laughs. Hendrix stops and does his set. We had never seen anyone have sex with a Stratocaster, and that's essentially what he was doing, says Wood, who became a radio broadcaster. Niels Lofgren, then a teenage guitar player whose band Crystal Mesh opened for the Hollies at the Ambassador, was among those who dashed uptown from the Who show. It was seeing Jimi Hendrix there that kind of struck a chord in me, that maybe this was something that would be a calling or a profession, says Lofgren, who now plays in Bruce Springsteen's E Street Band. Hendrix came out and said he was going to dedicate the first song to Pete Townsend, and he was going to do a rendition of Sergeant Pepper, Lofgren says. Being naive and huge Beatles lovers, a lot of us thought, well, you're only a three-piece band, how can you play Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band? There's all these other guitars and strings and violins. We just didn't have a clue what Hendrix was really about. He counted off the song, and I remember he kind of disappeared. He just did one of those things where he fell to the floor, almost sitting on the floor, rocking with the guitar between his legs, doing kind of a purple haze, Sergeant Pepper riff. Everyone just jumped up to try to see him, and from that moment on everyone was standing and mesmerized by obviously the greatest guitar player that ever lived, certainly in rock and roll. After a blistering set, some fans noticed that Hendrix switched guitars amid the pounding chords to the last song, Wild Thing. He knelt and made his burnt offering, then smashed the instrument on the stage. The violent act exhilarated but also shocked those who were present. He wasn't just playing music, he was invoking spirits, I believe, says Charles Smith, the Bumpo co-founder, who continues to make music with Soundwater. People in the audience went crazy, but I thought it was kind of contrived, says Johnson, the former community activist. The theatrics overshadowed the fact that this guy could really play. Backstage after the show, Hendrix said he needed a ride to the hotel with his little dolly bird, as he referred to the pretty young thing he was with, according to Connie Wright, who saw the show with two friends from Baltimore. They provided the ride and briefly visited his room. He was affable and sweet and unassuming, Wright says. Among the topics of conversation was Winnie the Pooh. The Sunday performance at the Ambassador is believed by some aficionados to be the last time he ever burned a guitar on stage. The sacrificial instrument split into pieces. Someone in the crowd grabbed the neck while the body of the black strat went on decay. The sacrificial instrument split into pieces. Someone in the crowd grabbed the neck while the body of the black strat went on display in the lobby. Hendrix signed the white pit guard. Good luck. Be cool. Jimi Hendrix, 13th of August 1967, according to Mike Paper. 
After the theatre closed, Paper took custody of the guitar body and displayed it wherever he lived. It was stolen from his house in Kensington around 1980, he says. At the moment of combustion and destruction that last night in the Ambassador, a string popped off the instrument. Wood scooped it up. He keeps it coiled in a clear plastic guitar string case on a shelf in his office. For so many friends of mine who play, it's like this relic, Wood says. If they hold their hands over it, something mystical will happen. It's the high E string, the most fragile, the one for scaling sonic peaks. It bears a bit of char. Guitarist Niels Lofgren on Hendrix, from an interview appearing in Vintage Guitar Magazine, confirmed the Washington Post story as follows. One night in D.C. I saw the Herman's Hermits, the Blues Magoos, and the Who at Constitution Hall. It was a great show. Then my friends and I ran to the Ambassador Theatre to see the Jimi Hendrix experience. It was an amazing evening. Pete Townsend was in the audience. Jimmy's set was life-changing. I left there knowing I had to try to be a professional rock musician, an idea that had never occurred to me until that night. Saturday, August 12th, Ambassador Theatre, Washington, D.C., two shows. Sunday, August 13th, Jimmy is arrested in Washington, D.C. for jaywalking. Alternatively, some suggest it was actually for public drunkenness. And for the last day in D.C., the group did the Keep the Faith for Washington Youth Fund gig, followed by the Ambassador Theatre's last two shows. Tuesday, August 15th, Fifth Dimension Club, Ann Arbor, Michigan. Two shows, excerpt from the Ann Arbor Observer article titled When Hendrix Played Huron Street. Then, on the night of August 15th, 1967, the Jimi Hendrix experience came to town. Just two months earlier, the trio had given their historic performance at the Monterey International Pop Festival. The Fifth Dimension concert would be the group's only non-coastal appearance during their first American tour. Two shows were scheduled for that Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. and 10 p.m. Two bands opened. The Hideaways, a group of Ann Arbor High students who specialized in covers of R&B and rock hits, and Kalamazoo's The Time. After their opening sets, the experience came on stage. Hendrix, bedecked in tight gold pants, a colorful jacket and beads and scarf, played a white Fender Stratocaster for most of his 30-minute sets. As Hendrix biographers have been quick to note, he also used his Ann Arbor appearance to test drive two new additions to his stage setup, a Gibson Flying V guitar, which he'd just acquired and hand-painted with psychedelic swirls, and a Vox Wawa pedal. Hideaway's lead singer Al Jaquez vividly remembers the performance. The experience opened with Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, which was such a cool thing to do. I remember them playing The Wind Cries Mary, Foxy Lady, and Purple Haze. They sounded good. Hendrix was loud, but not excessively, ridiculously loud. The drummer, Mitch Mitchell, did not play hard at all. He had a very light touch. Other attendees remember that the group also played Hey Joe and Fire. Jacques, who was lead singer for Savage Grace, would open for Hendrix several times in 1970, was especially impressed with Jimmy's demeanor that night in Ann Arbor. He was very relaxed. He had a humbleness about him, a shyness, and he smiled a lot. As the group played, you had the sense that they were having fun. They were looser and freer than the bands we were used to seeing. Jimmy did have amp problems during one of the sets. At one point, he unplugged the guitar from his amp and plugged into Noel Redding's bass amp. But he wasn't a diva about it at all. He struck me as real mature. The Detroit Free Press sent its teen editor, Lorraine Alterman, to cover the performance. Headlined, Hendrix Wow's Crowd in Ann Arbor. Her review was partially reprinted in the September 16, 1967, issue of Billboard magazine. Playing at the Fifth Dimension in Ann Arbor recently, Altman wrote in The Freep, The Jimi Hendrix experience proved themselves to be a tremendously exciting act, both in the recording studio and possibly more so while on stage. On stage, Hendrix, with hair a la Dylan, puts on a show with his brilliant guitar work and electric stage presence. While performing, he swings his guitar in back of him and plays it resting on his back. He also zings the strings with his teeth and falls to the floor, playing each chord seductively while on his knees and on his back. In Ann Arbor, when his amplifier blew, he flung the amp to the floor at the end of his last set and jumped up and down on top of it. Paradoxically, he never blows his cool. While he's frantic, he's casual. As he's hurling the instrument around, a gleam of humor comes through. He's hip without being a hippie, that is, he's without the pretentiousness and pomposity which afflicts too many hippies. Hendrix's voice has that tough, soulful quality that reflects his roots in the blues. The group is tight and musically disciplined, 
while their music is freed from traditional constraints. Backstage that night, Jimmy chatted with a female fan. He handed her his beads and wrote his name and London address on a half-sheet of line notebook paper, inviting her to look him up if she ever made it to England. In December 2015, this dashed-off document was purchased at a Bonhams auction for $6,267. The day after the Experience's Ann Arbor appearance, Hendrix, Mitchell and Redding were on a plane to Los Angeles, where they'd played the Hollywood Bowl before returning home to London. After playing in Ann Arbor, Michigan on August 15, 1967, the Jimi Hendrix experience boarded a plane the next day in Detroit. According to one passenger, I sat and talked with Hendrix and the band for about an hour during the flight. The only paper I had with me was my United Airlines ticket envelope, which they all signed. Mitchell and Redding slept most of the time, but Jimmy and I talked for about an hour during the flight. This is one of the experience's first autographs, just two months after the group arrived in the United States and debuted at the Monterey International Pop Music Festival. Friday, August 18, 1967. Hollywood Bowl, Hollywood, California, two shows. The experience is interviewed by Bob Garcia for Open City, published August 24, 1967. The Rehearsals. Jacket worn by Jimi Hendrix during Hollywood Bowl is on display in Germany at a hard rock cafe, along with Jimmy's 1964 Texas model Fender Stratocaster guitar. This Olympic white strat features a tortoiseshell shell guard and a maple neck with rosewood fingerboard and pearl inlays. Originally owned by Gary Boyle, guitarist of Brian Auger's Trinity, Jimi Hendrix used this guitar regularly when he arrived in London in late 1966. It is now on display at the Hard Rock Casino in Vancouver. Hard Rock Casino of Vancouver. Hollywood Bowl, Steve McQueen, Stephen Stills and Jamming. Mitch recalled the last phase of the experience's first American visit as follows. Our other West Coast gig was the Hollywood Bowl, as guests of the Mamas and the Papas. For Noel and I particularly, it was like, core, the Hollywood Bowl. The Beatles played there. They were all incredibly friendly towards us. Nice gig, but again it wasn't our crowd. The word was going around L.A. about us, but the audience had booked their seats months before to see them, not us. We went down okay, but nothing grand. Noel Redding on the Hollywood Bowl gig. Los Angeles was hard on us. We died a death in the Hollywood Bowl. The Mamas and the Papas folk-type crowd were the very opposite of our own followers. Jimmy hated being distanced from the audience's emotions, and at the bowl there is an ocean of a pool separating the stage from the people, and no roof to create the close, intimate atmosphere we fed on, and which enabled us to take the crowd out of themselves. Later in the evening, Jimmy and the band attends a party in Bel Air, hosted by John Phillips of the Mamas and Papas. Mitch had this to say, Great party afterwards at Phillips Mansion in Bel Air, quite extraordinary meeting Steve McQueen and people like that. Our first really Hollywood affair. We'd already met some of the LA musicians like David Crosby and Peter Tork, of course, and had been to Stephen Stills' place out in Malibu. That's where the jamming thing really started for Jimmy and me. At Stills' place, the equipment was up 24 hours for anybody that dropped by. Saturday, August 19th. Burning of the midnight lamp and stars that play with Sam's dice, the fourth English single release. Noel commented, It was a sign of the times that it took 42 hours to record Burning of the Midnight Lamp, while Wind Cries Mary had taken six minutes. The quest for perfection in the studio. With the band's coffers replenished from their recent spate of touring, Chandler brought the group back into Olympic Sound Studios to mine Hendrix's backlog of material. Bursting with confidence, Hendrix seemed eager to become further involved in the recording process, first by verbalizing to Eddie Kramer the sounds he was trying to create, and then by exhibiting a surprising dexterity behind the control room console. But while Kramer was infinitely patient with Hendrix, Chandler grew increasingly irritated with Hendrix's ceaseless quest for perfection. Chaz felt that Hendrix was wasting too much time on endless retakes of backing tracks. Spontaneity had been proven to work, at least in Chandler's mind. While there had been some thirty-odd takes of Hey Joe, the basic track chosen was the one first laid down by the band. Midnight Lamp Reviews The single burning of the midnight lamp and stars that play with Sam's dice was released to mixed reviews, with the one common denominator being that the it wasn't the stuff of a commercial hit. Reviewing it for Melody Maker, Bruce Johnston of the Beach Boys thought a lot of the fire and humour had gone out of Jimmy's music. However, he did concede that 
In three separate build-ups, the overall effect is hypnotic and reaches an interesting Wagnerian climax. Record Mirror thought it was Jimmy's best single to date. By contrast, a reviewer for Nottingham's Guardian Journal commented sadly, Seldom have I expected so much from a record and been so disappointed. The critics were proved right. Midnight Lamp was Jimmy's first single not to reach the top 10, peaking at 18 in the UK charts. But Jimmy didn't seem to change his mind. That song was the song I liked best of all we did. I'm glad it didn't make it big and get thrown around. Midnight Lamp Analysis Hendrix commentators have described burning of the midnight lamp as introspective and melancholy. Number and quote Hendrix as offering the following insight into the inspiration behind the song. There are some very personal things in there. But I think everyone can understand the feeling when you're traveling that no matter what your address, there is no place you can call home. The feeling of a man in a little old house in the middle of a desert where he is burning the midnight lamp. You don't mean for things to be personal all the time, but it is. Teku. While analyzing this explanation further, Hendrix biographers Shapiro and Glebeek propose the following. The house in the desert becomes a metaphor for Jimmy's own suffocating frustration at failing to produce the song he wanted in the studio, failing to communicate or being a victim of failed understanding. The time for reflection on the plane leads Jimmy to consider the downside of being the electric gypsy. The circus comes to town and moves on leaving no trace that it had ever been there, no roots, no home, no love. But Jimmy keeps his own flame of love. Ultimately, the lamp is a beacon. Jimmy calls out to anyone who cares to listen. Saturday, August 19th, Earl Warren Showgrounds, Santa Barbara, California. Monday, August 21st, England, Heathrow Airport, London. Mitch had this to say, I had mixed feeling about coming back from the States, even that first time. I'd begun to get the flavor of it, especially L.A., I'd never seen anything like it at all. There was still work to do in Europe, but it was really a question of honoring bookings and getting some recording done. We knew we'd be back sooner rather than later. Tuesday, August 22nd, Manchester Lancashire Television. Recordings for Burning of the Midnight Lamp, BBC TV D Time. Broadcast live from 6.25pm to 7.05pm. Wednesday, August 23rd, Reprise Records. Released the Jimi Hendrix Experience's first album in the USA. Are you experienced? A case of bad timing. By the time the band had made an impact on America's national chart with the release of Are You Experienced, they had flown back to England. While it clearly would have made more sense to do a tour coinciding with the release of the new reprise album, once again the group was victims of their earlier UK and European success. More precisely, as a result of English demand management had booked numerous concert commitments that had to be fulfilled. But the reasons for going home were as much for personal as for business reasons. Jimmy almost certainly did not want to leave, but Chaz had recently got married to his Swedish girlfriend Lotta. Mitch was due to get engaged to his girlfriend Carolyn. While Noel and Mitch both felt they needed some respite from the madness of life on the road in America. As is happened, their return on the 21st of August was to be marked by both comedy and tragedy. Thursday, August 24th, London. Recordings for Top of the Pops on BBC TV, broadcast live and rebroadcast September 7th. Burning of the Midnight Lamp, studio shots with live vocals, two versions, photos. Alec Byrne, according to Hendrix biographers, Harry Shapiro and Caesar Glebeek. Jimmy did some TV recordings for Top of the Pops with Alan Price. As the live acts on the show, both were there to sing the vocals over backing tracks to their respective new singles so as not to contravene the musicians' union ban on miming. As Jimmy waited for the intro to Midnight Lamp, Alan Price's The House That Jack Built was played. Said Jimmy on the show, I like the voice man, but I don't know the words. And to a journalist later on, Burning of the Midnight Lamp is difficult enough as it is, and I was all queued up ready to say the words nice and clear. This really threw me man-mass confusion. Alan Price was quite happy. He got a second plug. Friday, August 25th. Photo call by photographer Terence Donovan at Upper Berkeley Street, London flat for the Sunday Times, and Mitch Mitchell gets engaged to Carolyn Kinsey. Saturday, August 26th, Speakeasy Club. Jimmy attends Dantalian's Chariot, Zoot Money's new band concert. Sunday, August 27th, Savile Theatre, London. The second show is cancelled due to the death of Brian Epstein. Live at Savile Theatre. The set list for the first show, Summertime Blues. Fire. 
The Wind Cries Mary, Foxy Lady, Catfish Blues, I Don't Live Today, Red House, Hey Joe, Purple Haze. According to Noel Redding, our first Savile set went great, but then we heard the sad news of Brian Epstein's death. The second was cancelled out of respect, but I felt he would have preferred the show to go on. Earlier in the year, Brian Epstein was interviewed by New York DJ Murray the K, where he said, Many of your listeners probably won't know about Jimi Hendrix. He has broken through big now. I suppose to the general public in England, it looks like an overnight success, but no star is born overnight and he's a great performer. Later at the Speakeasy Club, Jimmy participates in a jam session with Fairport Convention. Fairport Convention were an English folk rock band formed in 1967 by guitarists Richard Thompson and Simon Nicole, bassist Ashley Hutchings and drummer Martin Lamble and singer-songwriter Judy Dibel. Fairport's early live shows in London in the late 1960s saw Dibel share stages with names like Jimi Hendrix and Sid Barrett-era Pink Floyd. Famously, she sat on the front of the stage at the Speakeasy Club that night, knitting while Hendrix and Richard Thompson played to an appreciative crowd. Monday, August 28th, London, photo session in Hyde Park. Tuesday, August 29th, Nottingham Blues Festival. Sherwood Rooms, Nottingham. Nottingham Blues Festival Review. This review was written for the Guardian Journal at the time, titled, Here's an Experience That Hits You for Six, by Richard Williams. If you'll pardon the pun, watching and hearing Jimi Hendrix at the Sherwood Rooms last Tuesday, 29th of August, Nottingham was a supremely emotional experience. Yet the question is, how many of the 1,300 people there shared it? Naturally, there were scores of Hendrix fanatics in vociferous attendance, like most hardcore enthusiasts, they are incapable of objective judgment, and for them Jimmy can do no wrong. But there were also those, and I saw many of them, who were apparently nonplussed by the startling, electrifying show put on by the American and his accomplices, drummer Mitch Mitchell and bass player Noel Redding. This puzzled me somewhat, until the idea struck home that perhaps there are people who really dug the records of Hey Joe and Wind Cries Mary, but are not yet ready to see Hendrix live. To be sure, you have to put up with a lot to be able to appreciate him. There were long pauses for guitar tuning between numbers, a rambling spoken introduction to Purple Haze, and several wide open spaces where nothing at all seemed to be happening. But what came out of the 50-minute show was a demonstration of 1967 pop music, almost shattering in its occasional intensity, delivered with the offhand ease of Garfield Sobers, a famous West Indian cricketer, straight driving to the boundary, and that's where... I think Jimmy wants to take us to the boundaries of ourselves, the very limits of our souls. In his mindless thunder, he tries to help us find out something about the world around, the violence and the beauty, the love and the pain. But at the Sherwood Rooms, this objective could not be reached. The place was too big, the crowd too puzzled, and the acoustics cruelly sabotaged the rolling tom-toms of Mitchell. After opening with a roaring short version of Sergeant Pepper, the group charged into Howlin' Wolf's Killing Floor, which amply demonstrated Jimmy's roots in the urban blues he heard in his youth. He spun, twisted, and bent his rangy body in sympathy with every nuance of his screaming guitar, while Redding did a little jig of joy, and Mitchell threw himself all over his immense drum kit in a frenzy of jagged rhythm. Fire, his rocking teeny bopper song, preceded a rather perfunctory version of Hey Joe, which helped to prove my pet theory that when people play their old hits faster than the recorded version, they're just not interested in them anymore. His solo, played with his teeth, also demonstrated that the original was played in the conventional manner, as he never approached the fluent swing of the record. I Don't Live Today, although short, showed that he was getting down to the nitty-gritty, and then came the real stunner when he complied with requests to play his famous version of Dylan's Like a Rolling Stone. As Mitch and Noel riffed quietly in the background, Jimmy's guitar sputtered and smouldered until the phrases caught fire as he crashed out the song's chords. He sang the words quietly and with respect to their composer, and on the last chorus he built up such a climax that the music seemed almost to continue under its own internal momentum. It lasted well over fifteen minutes and was quite simply a masterpiece, but the final freedom was realised in Purple Haze, at the end of which he created a beautiful sound picture by thumping his guitar against the huge wall of speakers behind him, before carelessly casting the instrument to the ground, giving the crowd a wave and a shrug, and shambling off, followed by his henchmen. 
In a way, the three of them are all musical assassins. They twist, tear, and murder noise, and in doing so, present a virtual insult to the senses, which can't help but provoke a reaction. Mitch may well become the most important of them all, because he seems to be on the way to developing a new style of rock drumming, based less on the insistent splash of a cymbal than on a ceaseless torrent of sound from all the devices at his disposal. He is on his way to almost totally arithmetic playing, with no steady beat or pulse, but whether that innovation is ever accepted only time will tell. After all, you won't be able to dance to it. Wednesday, August 30th. Jimmy visits the The Inn Club London, during which the club gets raided by the police. Thursday, August 31st, 1967. Germany. Photo session at the Oktoberfest at Luna Park in Berlin. Noel recalled, Jimmy didn't bother to attend the German press reception in preparation for the Berlin TV show that would launch our tour with traffic, so I got stuck doing all the talking in my pidgin German. I wondered if Jimmy's heart was still in the States, and he'd lost interest in Europe. But if Jimmy was impatient with the tour, there was no escape in Berlin. We went to the Playboy Club with the small faces and the Bee Gees, but the atmosphere was heavy, and our energetic attempts to party fell flat. And so August ends. Noel fittingly has the final say. The pace was so grueling that the memory of fatigue colours all my recollections of that time. We sometimes felt incapable of facing another bunch of journalistic brain pickers and trying yet again to come up with something fresh, witty, incisive, clever and intelligent. Jimmy tended to play the spaced-out refugee from Planet X, leaving the interviewer to interpret as they wished. Worst of all, I started to hate flying and reckoned my odds of survival were getting grim. I'd sit at the back, hopefully next to a priest or a nun, but usually next to a screaming baby. That concludes episode 13 in this series. Stay tuned for the next installment, where we will examine September 1967 and the Scandinavian tour. Please remember to check the channel's community tab and video information page, where you will find links to any related videos, performances and stunning photographs from the period, and any updates. Also, don't forget to subscribe for future content updates. By the way, if you have any stories or anecdotes to contribute, we would love to hear from you. Lastly, thank you so much for your wonderful comments and continuing support. Disclaimer. The images and photographs we are displaying are from a different range of sources, such as Pinterest, Tumblr, etc., except when and where noted. If you are the copyright holder and would like them removed or credited, please get in touch.